Hi, I'm Rich with Inside HPC. We're here at ISC 14 in Leipzig, Germany, and we're here at the HP booth. And I'm here with Nick Dubé. How you doing, Nick? Hi, Rich. Good. Always good to see you. Well, thought, yeah, yeah. It's been a while, but I uh, uh, thought we'd come and see this new Apollo system. What are we looking at here? Well, it's out finally after yeah. many years of being a secret project. Uh, a lot of people talking about it, but now finally we can show it to the public. Uh, show the folks what we've been working on for now uh, a couple of years. So we're very, very excited. Okay. So Apollo, when you look at it, it's a true HPC platform from the ground up, targeted at going really after the super scale market. It, go, it comes in a rack, basically as a full rack. So think about it as a, it's a, like a blade chassis, but rack size, right? Okay. Um, 144 nodes per rack, so very, very high density. And the rack, we're not cheating. It's a 24 inches rack by 48 inches deep. So it's not like some, some weird rack that's like twice, four times the size of a normal rack. Right. Okay. 144 nodes in a normal rack. Okay. It sits perfectly on your raised floor tiles. So for floor loading issues, that's a real good thing. Okay. So, all right, 144 nodes. And then you see that the rack is actually divided in eight cells. In each cell, you get 10 trays. In each tray, you get two nodes. So you're like, well, that adds up to 20. Well, not really. What we do is that we take the 10th tray and we put an integrated switch in. So that allows you to have 18 nodes connected into your 36 port switch. 36, uh, 18 ports go through the back to connect your leaf cabling. And then 18 ports go to the front on QSFP to build your IB uplinks. Okay, so that reduces cabling and complexity and all that stuff, well, right? Obviously, and, and speed of deployments, uh, your cabling cost is much reduced by doing that. It just makes it testing, just makes it a whole simpler system. Yeah, yeah. We, by the way, do the same thing on Ethernet as well. We don't have the module in here. It's being uh, worked on right now in Houston, but basically that module in the middle will give you the integrated Ethernet switch. Okay. So you get 144 ports of Gigi for your administrative network or your boot network, and then you can go up links with 10 gigi or 40 gigi, all built in. So how do you get this density? This would get awfully hot with all the circuitry so close together. So there's two things. Uh, to get a, a, a system, a rack this density, uh, by the way, it goes up to 80 kilowatt of, of power capacity. You need two things. The first thing is that obviously you won't air cool it. That would require way too much airflow. Yeah. The second thing is that powering it up at 208 would be, would be impossible. Way too many amps, right? So you need to go with modules like these. This is actually a 10 kilowatt rectifier. It's quite heavy, but basically what that does is that it, it will take 480 AC, so high voltage AC, and rectify it to DC current, and then inside of the rack will distribute at high voltage DC. Just by doing that alone, right? High voltage AC inside in, to the rack, high voltage DC inside the rack, just on the power distribution alone, you're gonna save in the order of four, five, six percent just of energy efficiency just on the power delivery. Now, the real cool part of that rack is the unique way in which we provide liquid cooling. Because you know liquid cooling's been around for a while. It's oh, been yeah. around since the 1970s, right? Yeah, sure. But it's never became mass market because it was so complex. Remember the racks with fluorinet and everything? So yeah. The revolution is not so much in liquid cooling. The revolution is how do we commoditize liquid cooling? How do we make it a mass market product? And with this, this, one, this was one of the main drivers behind that project, and I believe this is what we've accomplished. All right, so that rack, you look at it, to service a node, it's as simple as disengaging the cooling device, and I'll show you how that works in a minute, then pulling out the tray, and that's it. Basically, you have a tray here, and that's got two processors, and then the memory underneath here, and then the heat extraction actually happens with that thermal contact plate. Okay. So those are heat pipes. So a heat pipe is basically a device, it's a hollow copper tube yep. that will have a tiny, tiny amount of water vapor in it. As it captures the heat on the processor, yep. that vapor travels this side, then condensates back on that content contact plate that is kept cool and then as it goes back into liquid form through capillary reaction it goes back this way so vapor liquid vapor liquid vapor liquid okay. it can't break so there's no liquid flowing through this uh, how do you, where's the water flowing so here? so you got it so basically this is for all practical purpose 
This is a liquid cool server with no liquid in it. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. So, so how do you do it, right? Yeah. So we do it through that system here, and I don't know if you're able to go in and show how it works. Sure, sure. But basically, that moves in the thermal bus bar yeah. and makes mechanical connection to the tray, and that's where we extract the heat. Okay. So when you engage that clamping system, that second clamp, the thermal bus bar makes very strong, think a thousand pounds of force. Okay. Mechanical connection there, and the water flows in that in the thermal bus bar inside of the rack. Okay. It never actually goes in the node. Okay. We think that's a huge value prop because everybody right now out here at ISC, there's probably like 13 companies with a different approach on liquid cooling. Yeah. And they all have those dripless connectors. Yes. So we joke around when saying, do they call them dripless because they drip none or because <laughs> they drip less? Right? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. for us, once you pull the tray out and that the yeah. rear server doesn't have the memory or, or the plates, you can see there is no water connection here. Yeah. That's just electrical. That's electronics and electrical. Yeah. Okay. And electrical, you're like, wow, that's a finicky little connector. Yeah. Well, guess what? That's 1,200 watts step-down transformer. How do you get 1,200 watts in such a small connector? Well, it's high voltage DC. High voltage DC doesn't require a whole lot of amps, so you're able to use much smaller, much more efficient connectors. Oh, oh, very clever. So let's okay. have you do it. So basically, All right. you reinsert the tray in the system, yep. and then the first thing you do is go in, re-engage the electronics, and engage the, the cooling system for me. All right, so I'm I'm gonna just I'm gonna release it. the crack in here. And that's it. it. That's it. Oh, I just gotta screw it tight. Okay. That's it. For the shipping version, we actually have a latch in, instead of a little screw. But that's how easy it is to service a liquid cool system. Amazing. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. One, one last feature on the front part of the rack. You're like, why are there fans in a liquid cool system? Yes. Well, if you look at it, and I'm gonna pull it out again, and that's just basically to show how easy it is, right? Yeah, okay. So if you look at the inside of a server, 80, 85% of, of your heat load's gonna go into your processors, your memory, and your accelerators. The rest of it, the InfiniBand NIC, the small voltage regulators, they're small heat offenders, right? So it's not cost efficient to try to liquid cool all of the small components. So what we do is that we direct contact liquid cool the big heat offenders. Again, CPU, GPU, memory, the rest of it, we actually flow air through them using those fans in the middle. But as you can see on the side there, there's a water to air heat exchanger in the rack. So what happens is that water first comes into the rack, flows through that heat exchanger, makes colder air. Those fans blow the cold air across the door and then rotates around. So that basically makes it so that although Apollo is like about 80% component level liquid cool, once the door is closed, yeah. it's a 100% liquid cooled rack. You don't need any data center air. That rack you can deploy on a concrete slab in a storage room, okay. plug water, Plug electrical, yeah. plug network, you're yep. done. It's like a mini data center in a rack. Okay, so so what's the flow? I mean, can I hook up a garden hose or do I need like a fire hose? What are we <laughs> talking about here? So each rack, um, basically when we sell the whole system, it comes in a kit. Okay. So you don't only get the liquid cool system because one of the things we figured out with NREL as our first deployment is that it's really nice to have a good liquid cool rack, but if we have a whole bunch of pain we, we give to the customer to build the infrastructure, it's not going to become a mass market product. Right. So when you buy an Apollo system, it actually comes with the IT rack, with a CDU, which is a coolant distribution unit rack that couples with your facility, and then it comes, it even comes with a plumbing kit. And the plumbing kit is pre-manufactured, much cheaper than doing it on site, and allows you basically to connect a liquid cool system within hours for what would have taken weeks if you would have done custom plumbing on site. And in terms of flow, each rack is, well, you can, our water spec, you could almost fill it with your garden hose. The first system at NREL, we filled up the rack with a garden hose. <laughs> okay, Nick, so what are we looking at here? This is the back of the rack. So the back of the rack, as you can see, is, is composed really of eight cells, as, as, as I described in the front. And well, basically all cell will, can uh, function independently. Uh, what you also see in the middle here is the back of the power shelves. Mm. So power will come in in North America with four, four of those 30 amp plug, 32 amp plugs. 
in Europe, uh, 30 amp in North America, sorry, 32 amp in Europe. Europe will be the pin and sleep type. And then you have those connectors coming out of those power shelves and then powering up all of those eight modules to bring the high voltage DC. So that's our power infrastructure. You also see fans. Basically, that's for the air we're pushing front, the cold air we're pushing to the front. Yep. We have fans here through the trays helping out to bring the hot air, hit those doors, and then rotate yeah, uh, back yeah, in. Yeah. What you also see is the management modules. All the management modules actually get aggregated in the, in the center console, uh, center management module for the rack. So to manage 144 servers, all the sensors, the water temperatures, the pressure, it's one patch cord. You don't need to deploy 144 uh, patch cords and everything like you would do on, a, uh, on other systems. Yep. Here is a special region that we use for fabric cartridges. And they, that basically allows us, that's where we come and put in a kind of backplane to connect all of the nodes in Finiband to the integrated switch that's in the 10 slot, slot of each cell. And through those, uh, we call those glove box, that's yep. basically a route for routing the InfiniBand cables that plug in the front with the QSFP, and all of the optical lines come out, you can route them up or down. Okay. Looking at the plumbing, you see that the rack is actually has those unions. Yep. Why is the rack has those unions? Because we deliver the rack in most places internationally by actually unstacking the top section, and basically we ship the, up to this module, and then the top module, we just lift it, and wow. put it on top. Okay, sure. That allows us to go pretty much anywhere, but also allows us to air freight it, because that's oh. the site of a, of a ULD for an airplane right, uh, right. cargo you, bay. You don't want to lay this down, right? You yes. want to keep it upright. Okay. And, and it makes it super fast. Got it, yeah. So we just have to tie it up the union, boom, we're done. Okay. Looking at the plumbing, what you see here is that there's a supply line, return line, and then there's this. So what we actually do, and that's where there's actually three levels that will supply from the from the CDU into the heat exchanger first, because that's where we want the cooler water. Then from the heat exchanger return, we'll go and supply to uh, the water walls, the thing I showed you that moved in. Yeah. Uh, and then the two water walls are supplied from there and then return, we go back uh, to the CDU that does the heat exchange with the facility. Uh, you can connect from the bottom yeah. or from the top or make, from the top so yeah you see you, you got have the, yeah, if you got uh, overhead trays or something you, uh, yeah. overhead plumbing yeah, makes yeah. it very easy okay same for power power could be done uh, from the bottom or from the top mm -hmm. and what's also really interesting about our secondary plumbing is that although we think we have probably the most fault tolerant um, implementation of liquid cooling just to be sure if any of those pipes was ever to get loose, right? Yep. We implemented the secondary loop. So that's basically the water that flows through the rack. It runs under vacuum. It runs at sub-atmospheric pressure. Why does that matter? Well, it means that if, say, I was to play with that one, cut it or whatever, and it was to leak water, instead of leaking water, it will suck, suck, air, in, suck air into in. the system. <laughs> and almost instantly, we're yeah. going to detect it on our monitoring system, alert, say, hey, we have a vacuum leak, uh -huh. and we, that gives us plenty of time to go fix it without ever uh, dropping a, a, a drop of water. Our first customer, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, Steve Hammond, goes around saying, um, it's, it's been now 18 months, not a single drop of water uh, on the floor with that system, even with the prototype. Okay, very good.